Climate adaptation is our shift in how we do things, our lifestyle, uh, in order to deal with climate change. All the changes that we're seeing associated with more extreme weather events. The Nature Conservancy has been working in Oklahoma since 1986, and we're all about finding collaborative solutions to conservation challenges. Oklahoma is incredibly diverse, a wide variety of different ecoregions from forests in the east all the way to mesas in the west. I think when it comes to solving climate change, contrary to popular belief, I think it's gonna take every single one of us at the table to develop creative solutions to combat climate change. We're seeing more drought, rain patterns are changing, we're getting very heavy rain events. And what that means is a lot of water over a short period of time, and then periods in between rainfalls that we didn't see before where things can get very dry, and that can impact our food supply. And farmers and ranchers are having to adapt to those changes to make sure that our food supply is there for us. Uh, and that's that could be potentially one of the, the, the biggest impacts that uh, we can see is on the food supply for people in places that Food security was never an issue before. That also applies to water quality. One of the things that we can do is lean on nature to help us with this situation. There's a lot of nature-based solutions that we can utilize in order to better adapt and protect our water supply, our food supply, our homes, etc. And to me, that means we need to have members of the agricultural community, conservation organizations, state agencies, federal agencies, oil and gas companies, you name it, we all have to work together to develop solutions that are gonna be durable and will last. Climate adaptation is how we are responding to our changing climate that we are currently experiencing. We are seeing things like increased intensity of storms, increased frequency of storms, drought and wildfire and climate adaptation is how we are responding to those big stochastic experiences on the landscape. Fire is an integral part of our grassland landscapes. Our grasslands would not exist without fire. So consequently, when you remove fire from the landscape, you are actually harming the prairies found all across the Great Plains. Putting fire back on the landscape is a restorative tool that we use. One of our strongest partnerships in South Central Oklahoma is with the Chickasaw Nation, and it just so happens that two of our preserves, the Okayanali Preserve and uh, the Panatok Ridge Preserve, are within the Chickasaw Nation Reservation. We've been working with them for years on shared conservation priorities, and one of those shared priorities is building resiliency on lands within their reservation. Our prairies have, uh, especially our prairie grasses, have very deep roots. They can be sometimes six or 18 feet deep, and those roots, they break up the soil, they host microorganisms and a whole microbiome underground. In addition, they store carbon. And so when you remove the vegetative growth above ground through prescribed fire, all that energy is stored in the root systems below ground. And it doesn't go away, and the carbon isn't released when it's burned. We are implementing practices that we hope will create a more resilient landscape. We have invasive species um, that we need to manage, like woody encroachment that are threatening our ecosystems here. And so we manage wing elms, um, Osage orange trees, honey locusts, Chinese privet, and eastern red cedar trees. How we manage that is we use uh, various tools, conservation tools, such as herbicide application, mechanical efforts, such as like mulching or tree thinning, so chainsaw operations, and also the big ticket in order for our ecosystems to thrive is utilizing prescribed fire as a useful tool. The excess of carbon in the atmosphere is actually encouraging woody plant species to thrive. And so in order to manage that, we need prescribed fire to set back those woody invaders and also open up the canopy so that we can have herbaceous native plant species that also capture carbon as well. And also to create a cycle and a sense of rotational efforts with prescribed fire through dormant season and growing season burns. 
ways that prescribed fire helps with climate change is that it removes the excess nutrients in a sense of it improves water quality as we're adding fire, letting the native plant species grow and thrive, and then also promoting healthy water. But if we don't utilize good fire at the capacity that we need, as the system is ever changing and increasing in eastern red cedar trees, we could have a sea of eastern red cedar trees, which could be alarming a sense of bad fire. Wildfire capacity is going to start to increase. And so it's managing to, to set back those woody invaders, but also too to protect our investment as well so that we're promoting a healthy habitat, a healthy ecosystem so that not only just one species is thriving, but we need a whole community for, for the whole ecosystem to thrive. If you're really curious, take the time and educate yourself, ask those questions, reach out to the Nature Conservancy, reach out to your nearest field office, see what we can do to help you out. The Blue River is considered a high priority, uh, high quality water uh, by the Oklahoma Water Resources Board. And it's actually one of two undammed rivers in Oklahoma. There's very unique biological diversity in this river. There's 82 fish species. There used to be about 23 mussel species historically. And so it's a very unique area of Oklahoma. Probably heard a lot about the Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer, which is basically just an underground lake. And so we have groundwater that feeds the Blue River watershed. And so that it has that unique cold water that feeds it. And that way we have a lot of unique species that exist here that don't exist anywhere else in Oklahoma. The city of Durant gets most of their drinking water, pretty much over 90% of their drinking water from the Blue River. Something that a lot of people don't think about, especially when we're in drought, is that that impacts water treatment plants. So when the water is low in the river, that can create issues with more algae in the water for a lot of these warmer days and the water is a lot lower. And so then the water treatment plant has to work extra hard. They have to put extra chemicals in that water to clear up those algae blooms. When it comes to soil and that connection with water, what we do on the land has a direct connection to how it's gonna impact the water. And so that's where we look at it from like a watershed perspective. And you know, a lot of these things that we talk about with soil, when we talk about best management practices, we like to talk to landowners about potentially having cover crops. So instead of having bare ground in the winter, um, you would have plants growing during that time period. And then that way, like if there's a, rain, a big runoff event, then that sediment's not gonna end up in the stream because you actually have vegetation holding that soil in place. The opportunity for TNC is to really work with landowners, particularly in the watershed that we're in right now, in the Blue River watershed. You know, work with these different entities that are already educating landowners on these best management practices and work with them in like a supporting role to identify landowners in the watershed that would be willing to implement some of these practices on their land. Oklahomans maybe have shied away from conversations about climate change, but they are seeing uh, the impacts on the landscape and everybody is interested in building resiliency into their lands, whether you are a farmer, whether you are a rancher, whether you are a recreationist, whether you are just a back backyard gardener. Uh, everybody is interested in, in building resiliency into their landscape and ensuring that it is uh, as healthy as can be.